the third term talk for tonight. Um, before I introduce our speaker again, you know, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a rundown because I've had some inquiries about Mount Bennett Observatory. We are a small community-run observatory in the Dandenong Ranges, actually just out past Emerald on the way to Cockatoo. From Lilydale, it's a fair drive, but it is well worth it. We're actually run by members and we're open for members every Friday night and visitors can come at that time. Um, you can get to look through telescopes, you can get to meet all of us, and if you really like it, join us, because we're awesome. Now, um, we have a website, we have a Facebook page, they're all easy to find, ask us afterwards. So ask anybody with a t-shirt or a label and they'll be able to tell you. Now, to introduce our speaker again, this is Dr. Pietro Procopio. He's done a talk already, this is his second talk, and he will this time be talking about the the background or foreground radiation of the universe. <laughs> Thank you. And it's a little bit interactive, so you'll probably really enjoy this one. Thank you. You're making welcome. Thank you, everybody. My name is Pietro. Please feel free to interrupt me whenever you have a question or something is not clear. So we are going to talk now about foregrounds in the context of CMBR experiments. CMBR, I explained that in my previous talk, is actually the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is a very, very old light. It's the first light of our universe. It's a light that is almost 13 billion years old. So it's the really, really, it's the first picture of our universe. It's a very far away light, if you want also. And as I said, it's old. This light contains a lot of information of our universe. Indeed, we use the information in this light for um, constructing the models and the physical models and all that we need for exploring our universe in a theoretical way and for planning our missions. But unfortunately, this light is very, very weak and the efforts to detect this light are really, really huge. And uh, more than this, it's hidden behind uh, uh, foreground emissions. Those foreground emissions are much more stronger than this light, than the CMB, and are actually between us and this light, because given that this light is the first light of the universe, whatever else was created with the evolving universe, it's between us and this light. This is to say galaxies, stars, infrared light, whatever light you can imagine is between us and the light. So in this talk, I'm going to show you how can we deal with the foregrounds. So first of all, one would ask, can we avoid to look at them? So if you look at this artistic depiction of our universe here, this is our solar system in the center of this universe. Of course, we are not in the center of the universe. <laughs> and if you look in every direction out of the, in the sky, for the, you, you, get, you have to pass through the emission of our galaxy, that is this white haze here. Then if you go far away, you get emission from other galaxies. Then you get emission from clusters of galaxies. At the end, you get to look at the cosmic microwave background. So this is true in every direction that we look at. So the simple answer to these questions is no, unfortunately. We have to deal with the foregrounds, we have to observe them, and we have to know them. So we have to model them. Indeed, what our satellites or our detector sees in the sky, it's a superposition of emission. It's like a superposition of pictures. On the back, we have the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, and then we have a lot of foregrounds between, between the CMB and us. And uh, we, all, we really need to know very well how these foregrounds behave, how these pictures are made, because we want to subtract this picture, because those are much more stronger than the background. So the better we know them, the better we subtract them. To complicate things more, these foregrounds have different origins. So we have foregrounds from our solar system. So interplanetary particles can emit in the infrared light, so the highest range of the microwave. Uh, microwave window, and of course we get that in our experiment. We have foreground from our galaxy. So this is a map, a projection of our galaxy. It's like we project uh, our globe on a, on a map. And uh, what you see here, this line here, is our Milky Way. But it's a different color because in a different, spec in a different window of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is by far the most, the strongest emission in the microwave range. Then we have emission from the far galaxies, and we have emission from clusters of galaxies. So if you look at this graph, each point, every single dot in this graph is a galaxy. And you can see there are a lot of those. And this is just a tiny portion of the universe, what we can look in the universe. 
And of course, we have also uh, foregrounds noise from our detector. It's like uh, that we have to, you know, to clean the satellite, to clean the detector before launching it, like we clean, you know, the lens of the camera before taking pictures. And even after that, we want to get very fine details. So we need to know how our detector works. So in order to do that, in order to know everything, all these things, and especially to know how the foregrounds behave, the secret weapon that we use is the multi-frequency observation. So it means that given that this frequency range here, this is like, you can imagine this line here, like the colors, like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And here is the strength of the emission. Every line here is a different physical process. So as you can see, there are different lies in different process, and this lies in different places of this graph. So this means that some of these processes emit more in the red or in the orange. Other processes emit more in the blue or in the green, or whatever it is. So we need to know, we need to observe all these colors in the microwave range to know very well these emissions and to get rid of those. So I want to do an experiment here today with you. Unfortunately, we don't have any microwave satellite. We have a beautiful telescope outside, but it doesn't look in the microwave. But we have a pretty cool thing that is called music. And uh, you know that CMB is a light, so it travels by light. And uh, the music is sound. Anyone want to guess what these two entities have in common? Nobody? Waves. They propagate like waves. <laughs> and there is one particular thing about waves, it is frequency. So what frequency tell us? In sound, the frequency tell us how the sound is. It, if it is a low pitched sound, like for instance, if you are listening to a trombone, you expect that the most of the sound of the trombone is the low, in the low frequency end of the, of the spectrum. And the same thing is with the foreground. So as I showed, the red and the green and the orange lines on the left of the previous graph are what we call low energy, lower energy foregrounds. And uh, you have high pitched sound and higher energy emissions, of course. And uh, for instance, if you get a violin to play, you expect, you expect that the emission of the sound is more high, high pitched sound than a low pitched sound. So starting from this, I want to do a small experiment with you. So before going on, I just do like this and then do it like this. So we are going to listen to something. And we are going to listen like if you are going to do a multi-frequency observation. So at the beginning, we are going to listen to this uh, easy composition in just one frequency band. So if, like if, if, if we were looking at the sky la, just in the, in the red band, for instance. So this composition in just one frequency band sounds like this. You hear something grumbling, but you, can you distinguish any instrument here? It's pretty difficult. So, pardon? Double bass, double bass. There is no double bass. One of those big drums that you have. Exactly. Timpanies, exactly. Indeed, if we add another frequency, it gets a little bit more clear. We have some drums. So we knew, we know now this foreground, and we can subtract this foreground from our observation. We can subtract the foreground from, from our composition. So let's get rid of the percussions. We have other instruments now. Can you, can you resemble, recall some instrument? There is a piano, what kind of piano? Let's add another frequency. It's a keyboard, yeah. I'm trying to mimic an acoustic piano. Anyway, there is a piano in here, so we can subtract the piano. We have other instruments. Any guess of what other instruments are left? I can add another frequency. So we are now doing a four frequency observation of this of this music so it's a four frequency listening
There is a, I think there is a choir in the background. It's a choir, like people singing all together. We can get rid of the choir. And we have now, what else? What instrument is that? That was really amazing. It is a French horn indeed. And we are left now with a very, very weak background that is the cosmic microwave background in our case. But there is also some high pitched sound here, like the high frequency emission in the previous graph. And if I release, and if I observe the high frequencies available here, I can listen to some chime bells and cymbals or whatever it is, and I can, I can get rid of those because now I know that they are there. And I'm left with the cosmic microwave background that is the weakest signal in this composition and the weakest signal in the sky in the microwave range. So I really want to finish with that. I'm um, happy to answer all the questions that you have and to, you know, get, to go deeper in some aspect of you may want to know more. So thank you very much. It is indeed. Let me just stop this music. <laughs> so why do you think Brian Schmidt and his team got the Nobel for saying the universe is accelerating? Because they discovered that the universe is accelerating, actually. So they wanted to prove the opposite, I think. But they discovered that the expansion of the universe is accelerating now. And uh, what they discovered is this particular contribution, it's the particular component of our universe that is called dark energy. That is actually the biggest part, the biggest component of our universe. And it acts uh, as an anti-gravity. So it's, it's a repulsive force. It's not attracting force like gravity, but it's just pulling stuff away. And that's why the universe is expanding now, because this force is pulling stuff away faster than we thought. Yeah, even, even if it's not related to, to what I just said, I mean... It could be anything, yeah. Good question. Yeah, don't be shy. Uh, when gas goes into a black hole, why does it get hotter? Why does it get hotter? <coughs> this is a... It's a wow, it's really, really incredible, yeah. <laughs> So you're right, it gets hotter. It gets hotter because the gas starts to, uh, it has some friction, so it collides with other gas that is falling to the black hole. And uh, as long as they go you know, around the black hole and they go nearer and nearer the black hole, they feel the attraction of the black hole, uh, the stronger attraction of the black hole. Uh, the, the, the more near that they are, of course, in the black hole, the more strong is the attraction. And the more strong is the, is the force that is, you know, just making the, the gas to collide, the little particles to collide between themselves. It's like when you are in a, in, a crowded, in a crowded street and you collide with other people and you get hot because it's, it's boring and it's, you get frustrated, you cannot move. The gas feels more, more, almost the same way when it falls in the black hole. Yep. The question, the question That's right. Are, 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 how could you? Are all stars are planets, is what she asked. So not all stars are planets. So if you look at the sky, sometimes there is you know, some shiny dot that looks like a star, but is in reality a planet. You can see the, with your own eyes this. But you're asking if all the stars have planets. Uh, this is a very, very good question. And uh, we are discovering now a lot of planets around other stars but they are so far away that we actually cannot communicate with them. So we are still looking for, uh, you know, for planets that uh, in some way could, uh, could host human life, like, like our planet. And if you are lucky enough, 
maybe they are sending us a signal, we send them a signal, we can communicate with them, who knows, but it's really rare. But anyway, not all stars are planets, not all stars have planets, maybe, we don't know yet for sure. Oh, the difference between star and planet? The, the, the star is, um, uh, has uh, enough mass to, to start some uh, nuclear reaction, so the luminosity of the stars is intrinsic. The, the stars produce your luminosity. So, for instance, if you look at the moon, the moon is, you know, it's a satellite of, uh, of our planet, but planets are just like the moon, you know, a piece of, of round rock that, that are just going around the sun. And the moon, the night, is illuminated by the sun that we cannot see because it's on the other side of the planet with respect to, to, to where we are facing. But uh, even Jupiter, Jupiter, Saturn, cannot, they cannot bright from the, they don't have you know, a, a source of, uh, of brightness. They are just reflecting the light from our sun. That's the main difference, the, the stars can illuminate themselves. Let's put it this way. I have a question. Approximately, yeah. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> And, and I want to know if, if they can beat you on this. Um, how many extrasolar planets have been found up until maybe today? Eleven. Eleven? Much, oh. much more. Much Dang. more. Much more. Much what? more. How many? Hundreds of them. Anybody have a guess? The closest guess is it? Uh, One thousand. One thousand? I think that's, that's pretty close. Absolutely. <laughs> what color do you? Oh, yeah. Uh, how many? I, I have to check on my iPhone yeah. app, but um, <laughs> more or less 1,000 or almost 1,000 now. I don't know, but every day I see this app that they discover a few new planets. So every day they discover new exoplanets. Think about that. Question. I'm sorry, I can't hear it. I didn't get the second part, sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, it, well, it depends on the animal, of course. So. For instance, cats, of course, can see in the dark much better than us, no? So, for instance, if we, uh, if we go out in a night where there is no moon, just stars, we can barely see each other at this distance, while, you know, cats and animals that are more suited to go out at night, they can see much better. So, I think that those animals see, they can see much more stars than ourselves because they can see better at night, but, of course, there are animals that cannot. But that's a very, very interesting question, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Can I launch it? Oh, nice. Any more? Why was Pluto deemed a microplanet and not a planet? Because there is a lot of them out there. Is it the dwarf planet? Dwarf planet. So it's off, a. Taken off what we yes, yes, see, yes. Because they discovered uh, other planets that are it has the same size, more or less, of Pluto. And the guess is that there are much more of those around that, that region of the solar system. So they're saying, should we add all of them? Just take off one. Maybe it's easier to take off one and we just stick with the other eight planets. What are the planets? Pardon? What are the five more planets other than? The ones that are still classified as planets are you know, Mercury, Venus, the, our planets, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Uranus and Neptune. Those are the ones that still keep the, their name. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you.